Hello my friends and welcome to this video. In this one we're going to be talking about Longbridge and the demise or escape of the various wonderful prototypes and test models. The studio is a bit of a mess right now so I'm going to have to do most of this voice recorded so let's get to it. Let me know if you'd like a part two of this video or you'd like me to cover, cover anything else and make sure to subscribe and like the video and do all that other stuff so let's get to it. So first, the history. Now, the flight shed, of course, at Longbridge was used for various things. But at the start, of course, it was built during the World War II Shadow Factory Scheme in 1936. It was the first building constructed at Longbridge. And, of course, it produced um, aircraft such as the Hurricane, which were towed into the 20-foot high structure to be fitted with their engines, etc., emerging from the other side as a complete plane. Of course, it's had several roles, as mentioned, including the production of just Morris Marina gearboxes until the late 80s, I believe. Then, when Austin Rover's engineering arm took over the flight shed, the building was then used until the collapse of MG Rover in April 2005, with its eventual unfortunate demolition in 2001, when its roof was brought down and completely demolished by the 14th of December that year. But of course, what happened to the cars? Several iconic, mainly iconic Austins, Rovers and MGs were engineered in the flight shed, including several prototypes. Did they survive the collapse of MG Rover? Let's have a look. The main thing that we're going to be focusing on is the cars that were still there when, of course, the inevitable 2005 collapse happened. So let's get to it. So first is the RDX60 project. Now, the RDX60 comprised of two models originally, the RD60, the Rover branded 3 to 5 door models, and the X60, the MG badge version, with the same amount of doors. Later on in the program, of course, there was the RD61, a four-door was proposed, and then a five-door estate, the RD62. Due to, obviously, the tight financial situation at the time at MG Rover, the car was mainly derived from assets that they already had, such as the incredible Rover 75 chassis with a less complex rear axle arrangement. Gone was the Z axle and it was replaced with a more simplistic beam axle design. The project was then halted in 2003 due to spiraling costs. But what of the prototypes and mock-ups? After the shutters rolled down at MG Rover for the final time, the RDX 60 prototype and its derivatives were of course locked up in Longbridge for a considerable amount of time until nearly a decade later when they were removed from the resting place and remained in limbo once again. In 2019, the car was seen for the final time as the full site was finally wound down. Its fate sadly is unknown, but it is believed to have been scrapped along with all the other RDX prototypes. Which is, of course, is quite sad because that is a piece of motoring history lost, as usual, again. Next, my friends, is the MGF test platforms or the test cars for the MGF. So you have the PR1, which is the first prototype in the series of the MGF development models, with the PR the PR3 later on, which was the third one, the PR2 obviously being the second, becoming the MGF. The PR1 had an M16 engine under its bonnet, whereas the PR3 had the mid-engine layout that we're familiar with on the MGF. The last thing we heard about these models is that they were going to be saved. There was a article posted on the best Austin Rover British car website ever in the world, which is used to some of these sources. Check them out. You already know who they are. It's AR Online. Sadly, all I can assume is from the lack of updates from ev everywhere on the internet that they're now in a private collection stored somewhere on the site or they've been scrapped. There is no real definitive answer. And if you have an answer, let me know in the comments. Next is the MG Rexton. Now, because of the rapidly dis diminishing resources at the time, MG Rover were keen to obviously obtain the rights to multiple other manufacturers' platforms to build the MG Roverness into them. Obviously, you have the Tartar Indica, which is the shitty Rover, the City Rover, which I'd love to drive, by the way, if you've got one, let me know in the comments. And you have the Sangyong Rexton as well, which is obviously a Sayak-owned um, owned car. Now, the Sangyong Rexton, 
that thing um, was then given to Peter Stevens. Um, <laughs> he was essentially, and him and his team were essentially charged with making it look like an MG in a matter of days. And of course, three prototypes were eventually created, um, it's suggested, but only one has been confirmed. Now, the issue that they had, and obviously the main reason why they put it under the MG name was A, the ailing name of Rover at the time and the bad reputation of the mark, unfortunately, um, due to obviously the British media, um, absolutely sab self-sabotaging. But one of the stipulations under the licensing deal, which BMW did to license the MG mark back to Ro um, MG Rover, was that Longbridge could not produce an off-roader or a four-wheel drive type car bearing the Rover name because it would cause issues for Ford who owned a Range Rover and obviously you know riding around in a Rover people obviously referring to the in America the Land Rovers and Range Rovers as Rovers you know you've got multiple things there with, with brand identity which could obviously cause a few issues so the one confirmed prototype the mock-up was used by the security guards at Longbridge and was relatively unknown, apparently, to um, the MG's new parent company until their uh, merger with SIAC in 2008. So that is incredible that it just sort of slipped under the radar there. The car actually continued its service. Um, you can see here, obviously, it's a 2004 registered car. Continued its service as a security car on the site until the operations were discontinued in 2016 with the end of the LE500 MGF, um, which it was scrapped, sadly. So it did have a good run of 12 years driving up and down, but um, fortunately for us, it um, ended up getting scrapped. Next, we have the Rover TCV. Now, a lot is known about this car, and if you'd like me to do a full video on it, let me know. Essentially, this car was designed by Peter Stevens and his team at Longbridge. This was the more modern direction for Rover styling, removing, obviously, the retro cues from the 75. And it was a, essentially, as AR Online call it, and as I see it, a lifestyle estate before the lifestyle estate and the crossover, which is absolutely just forward thinking. I mean, you think of this Scout um, Rover Metro. That was another car that was ahead of its time, sadly. Of course... Pretty impossible to categorise in 2002 when the concept was obviously revealed. The very handsome blue car in this photo has sadly been killed. Um, and that's it. As far as I know, it's essentially a, a Rover 75 underneath, um, like a sort of a mock-up body shell. And it was essentially scrapped, which is damn, a damn shame. It's a damn shame they didn't produce that because it is a gosh damn handsome beast. They'd probably still be around today, I would hope so, if that had been produced, but sadly not. So here we are, we're on to my one, my all-time favourite MG. Obviously, it was never produced. The MG TF GT. Essentially, it's an MG TF Coupe. The GT concept was obviously a Coupe version of the MG TF with a KV6 engine. The plan was obviously to create a 200 brake horsepower KV6 with a top speed of 145 miles an hour, which would have absolutely ripped. While only a concept, it was essentially created to gauge the demand of the model. Sadly, this car remained in Longbridge um, and in the flight shed as well until I think it was around 2011. Um, I could be... An, uh, by the way, Hopton Garage in Staffordshire, you can visit the thing. Um, let me know if you would like me to come and do a video. I'd love to do a video on that thing. Great news, of course. This car was rescued, being the absolute beast it was. The MG TF GT is, a, is on display at Hopton Garage in Staffordshire. Um, fun fact as well, um, NAC, so Nanjang Auto Company, um, registered the design of the MG TF GT at the um, EU Intellectual Property Office in 2005 with the application being granted that year. So they essentially own that until sometime in the future, which is concerning but slightly good, I guess. Now, we move to the EU4 um, test types. So 
Euro 4 emissions, the standard was introduced on and enforced on all cars from January 2005 and all newly registered cars from 2006, um, same month. To pass, obviously, the EU 4 standards, petrol cars are to produce CO2 of no more than 1 gram a kilometre and the total hydrocarbon emissions of no more than 0 0.10 grams a kilometre and NOx emissions of 0 0.08, blah, blah, blah. It's just, it's emissions stuff. We're not interested in that. Anyway, several ZT EU 4s were produced, um, including a K-series a K uh, modelled ZT, which is actually for sale, so you can own a piece of history. I'm not being paid to do this. I just think this is a fantastic car. Um, link will be in the description for it, but essentially it's just um, it's just a test car, which is absolutely fantastic. So you could own a prototype, um, sort of one off. There were several produced, um, such as a V6. They gave it an extra catalyst, I believe, as well, which is quite interesting. Um, this obviously multiple. One of the most photographed and famous. Um, of these prototypes was VX08 OBW, an EU4 prototype. This, of course, is a ZT 190SE registered in 2008. Originally, this car was assembled in March 2005 as a Highland, a high Highline 190ZT. The car then became the proven car for the 2006 facelift ZT range. EU4 compliance, of course, on that car was achieved with several changes a fly-by wire throttle a bosch throttle body a new ecu and an extra catalyst for those of us that like to be under the cars with our portable angle grinders um i joke about that but that's happened to me twice um another notable notable difference was which lots of people rave about and say that they might have or might not have, and I would love to know how to get this, a low coolant warning lamp, which actually works in the coolant header tank. That's fantastic. This car was, of course, auctioned by Price Waterhouse Coopers during the administration of Longridge, during which saw some escapees such as this. Um, they these Most of these escaped in late 2007 to early 2008 and ended up being sold through car supermarkets such as this one which was sold in March 2008 and is now owned by an enthusiast and is obviously quite well known because it is one of the most photographed um of these EU4 test types in the um in the entire catalog of EU4 test types which is brilliant Next on our list is probably the most interesting and remarkable MGZT ever produced Previously owned by John Newey, one of the um, the owner, well, the owner of Summit Garages. Shout out, best one of the best enthusiasts in the country. Living legend, MG enthusiast. Of course, this MG is a four-wheel drive version. It was going to be called the Countrywise, supposedly, if the um, production was approved. The ZT pictured was originally a V8 Tora, one of the first ever produced. It was then later converted to a KV6 with the rest of the powertrain coming from a Land Rover Freelander. This model, originally saved from the crusher at the factory, went into Summit Garage owner John Newey's collection. This car was then, I think it was sold, there's no indication of whether or not it was sold in 2022 and its current location is unknown. If you own that car, please let me come and view it. It is the best car ever. I'd love to make a video on that. It needs far more visibility than it already has because it is such a fantastic, almost a, a proposed halo model of, you know, of these fantastic, fantastic cars. So next we move on to the abandonees. So these cars are essentially left, were left at the factory just in various states of disrepair and it's honestly very depressing but i think they all deserve their moment in the sun um of course credit where credit due some of these photos are from 28 days later some of these photos are from ar online which obviously pulled them through them 28 days later in some cases shout out keith adams one of the best writers on ar online um, and the rest of them are all legends as well Love that thing. Been reading AR online since I was a young boy, but here we are. So this one, of course, left the side of the flight shed. You've got a wonderful ZT, um, ZT in the back sitting on its brake discs. 
Another 75 just in front of that, as well as two more cars at the right. I can't really identify. And then in the forefront, you've got the Rover 75, one of the first ever left-hand mo um, drive models produced on some very, very awful wheels. I don't know what they are. Oh, no, you can't really see them, actually, because the photo quality is so bad. Anyway, then you've got a disgraceful yellow Tata Indica. What the heck is this thing doing? Um, again, I've never driven one, so I can't really give you my opinion. I, I'd love to drive one, though. Let me know if you've got one. I assume this was perhaps going to be a sport model that we're experimenting with it with various different bumpers, etc. Hence why it's got no bumpers on it. But that was also scrapped. These cars are all confirmed dead, by the way, just to let you know. Then Elephant House 75, Tora, very sad looking. It's very sad to see a cars that you hold in such high esteem be in such disrepair. Now, there's another prototype here. It's the Streetwise prototype. You'd be... Um, you know, forgiven for mistaking this as a, as a ZR, but essentially it's a ZR with loads of bits stuck on it. It's a streetwise prototype. Very interesting, it's dead. Next is the visitor's centre, the back of it. You can see there, well, it's the side of it, I think, actually. Yeah, it's the side of it. Various models and states of disrepair. You've got a um, 45, you've got a few ZTs, a ZR in yellow with the best colour for it. Another really, really lovely um, set of 25s. I think these are all dead as well. This photo annoys the hell out of me. This is apparently some workers from um, NAC smashing up some 45 body shells with a crane, obviously, to crush them into, um, you know, because they can't be used anymore, which is a damn shame. So it's a very poignant photo. Here's another Z, ZT. This thing is presumed to be an EU4 Tester V8. Um, don't know if that thing ever made it out. There's no obviously record of these or the VINs or anything, so I'm not 100% sure. If anybody else has one of these escapees, let me know. It'd be great to see and know about. Of course, here you go. There's a few more cars littering the landscape here. You've got a wonderful Old English White um, 75 Tora with no bumper. Got a few MGTFs and a few 45s. There's even a 400 somewhere in there, somewhere. Um, the ZTs as well, especially, are quite cool. Again, a lot of the old, the um, unsold cars ended up sitting in Cofton Park for a little bit. Um, and then they obviously got moved on. These were the complete cars. Another legend, BX54 OPL. Not sure what happened to this car. This is a Rover 75 long wheelbase V8. Um, essentially a 75 limo. You can see it there in the background as well. Again, next to the G-Series ZS. Um, that, of course, I believe that one is now dead. The Z, there's another ZS as well. This is another, I believe, um, G-Series or Fiat-derived diesel tester. Um, that is also believed to be dead. Another ZT, um, I think it's a diesel, probably some EU4 diesel or something. It's probably dead. Then, of course, you have some photos from inside of the flight shed and inside some of the plant at Longbridge. There's the RD, the RDX60 um, mock-up. That's dead. Some engine testing equipment in the flight shed. That's all gone. A very early X-Reg Tora. That's dead. And, and just a poignant reminder of, obviously, the culture that was kind of lost. And I'd love to make a full-on documentary about sort of the work culture at Longbridge, if anybody would like to do that. The, sort of the culture that's sort of been lost. It, every workplace has a culture. Every workplace has its little idiosyncrasies, its little inside jokes. And, of course, that ended up vanishing within a blink of an eye for some people, which is quite sad. Um, 75 clay model. Don't know what that was used for. I assume for the development of the 75. A very early V-Reg 45. Um, I assume it was previously a 400 and then the face lifted it to look like a ZT. Uh, a ZS, sorry. An MGZR with some test equipment in it. And then, here we go, more test cars. A lot of cars did survive, and if you have a survivor, let me know in the comments because I'm very interested. I've heard a few great... Just insanely great stories, for example, an Australian test where 
um, ZR got brought back and the guy that tested it um, while he was working at MG Rover then purchased it. Um, and it's still rovering around and MGing around today. Just loads of great stories. So that's about that for me. If you want to see any more of this, let me know. Thank you for watching. Keep watching. Let me know what the next topic should be. And remember to subscribe for more of this. Me talking about cool cars.